Here at Floral Street's got the same deal we got. Where is Pete Van Horn anyway? Isn't he back yet? Suddenly, there is the sound of a car's engine starting to turn over. We look across the street toward the driveway of Les Goodman's house. He is at the wheel, trying to start the car. Can you get started, Les? Les Goodman gets out of the car, shaking his head. No dice. He walks toward the group. He stops suddenly as, behind him, the car engine starts up all by itself. Les whirls around to stare at the car. The car idles roughly, smoke coming from the exhaust, the frame shaking gently. Les's eyes go wide, and he runs over to his car. The people stare at the car. He got the car started somehow. He got his car started. The people continue to stare, caught up by this revelation, and wildly frightened. How come his car just up and started like that? All by itself. He wasn't anywhere near it. It started all by itself. Don Martin approaches the group and stops a few feet away to look toward Les's car. And he never did come out to look at that thing that flew overhead. He wasn't even interested. Why? Why didn't he come out with the rest of us to look? He always was an oddball. Him and his whole family. Real oddball. What do you say we ask him? The group starts toward the house. In this brief fraction of a moment, it takes the first step toward changing from a group into a mob. The group members begin to head purposefully across the street toward the house. Steve stands in front of them. For a moment, their fear almost turns their walk into a wild stampede. But Steve's voice, loud, incisive, and commanding, makes them stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's not be a mob. The people stop, pause for a moment, and then, much more quietly and slowly, start to walk across the street. Les stands alone, facing the people. I just don't understand it. I tried to start it, and it wouldn't start. You saw me. All of you saw me. And now, just as suddenly as the engine started, it stops. And there is a long silence that is gradually intruded upon by the frightened murmuring of the people. I don't understand, I swear. I don't understand. What's happening? Maybe you better tell us. Nothing's working on this street. Nothing. No lights, no power, no radio. Nothing except one car. Yours. <laughs> The people's murmuring becomes a loud chant, filling the air with accusations and demands for action. Two of the men pass Don and head toward Les, who backs away from them against his car. He is cornered. Wait a minute now. You keep your distance. All of you. So I've got a car that starts by itself. Well, that's a freak thing. I admit it. But does that make me a criminal or something? I don't know why the car works. It, it just does. This stops the crowd momentarily, and Les, still backing away, goes toward his front porch. He goes up the steps and then stops, facing the mob. What's it all about, Steve? We're all on a monster kick, Les. Seems that the general impression holds that maybe one family isn't what we think they are. Monsters from outer space or something. Different from us. Aliens from the vast beyond. <laughs> you know anybody that might fit that description around here on Maple Street? What is this? A gag? This is a practical joke or something? <laughs> the eyes of the crowd are cold and accusing. Now that's supposed to incriminate me, huh? The car engine goes on and off, and that really does it, doesn't it? I just don't understand it. Any more than any of you do! Look... You all know me. We've lived here five years, right in this house. We're no different from any of the rest of you. We're no different at all. Really, this whole thing is just, just weird. Well, if that's the case, Les Goodman, explain why. <gasps> explain what? Look, let's forget this. Go ahead. Let her talk. What about it? Explain what? Well... Sometimes I go to bed late at night. 
A couple of times, a couple of times I'd come out here on the porch and I'd see Mr. Goodman here in the wee hours of the morning standing out in front of his house, looking up at the sky. That's right, looking up at the sky as if, as if he were waiting for something. As if he were looking for something. She's crazy. Look, I can explain that. Please, I can really explain that. She's making it up anyway. I tell you, she's making it up. He takes a step toward the crowd, and they back away from him. He walks down the steps after them, and they continue to back away. Suddenly, he is left completely alone, and he looks like a man caught in the middle of a menacing circle as the scene slowly fades to black. Act 2, Scene 1 Fade in on Maple Street at night. On the sidewalk, little knots of people stand around talking in low voices. At the end of each conversation, they look toward Les Goodman's house. From the various houses, we can see candlelight, but no electricity. The quiet that blankets the whole area is disturbed only by the almost whispered voices of the people standing around. In one group, Charlie staring across at the Goodman's house. Two men stand across the street from it in almost sentry-like poses. It just doesn't seem right, though, keeping much on them. Why, he was right when he said he was our neighbors. Goodman ever since they moved in. We've been good friends. That don't prove a thing. Any guy who'd spend his time looking up at the sky early in the morning, well, there's something wrong with that kind of person. There's something that ain't legitimate. Maybe under normal circumstances we could let it go by, but these aren't normal circumstances. Why, look at this. Nothing but candles. Why, it's like going back into the dark ages or something. Steve walks down the steps of his porch, down the street to the house, and then stops. Sorry guys, the internet crash. We're picking up right here, uh, scene two. Walks down the steps of his porch, down the street to the Goodman's house, and then stops at the foot of the steps. Les is standing there. Ethel Goodman behind him is very frightened. Just stay right where you are, Steve. We don't want any trouble. But this time, if anybody sets foot on my porch, that's what they're gonna get. Trouble. Look, Les. I've already explained to you people. I don't sleep very well at night sometimes. I get up and I take a walk and I look up at the sky. I look at the stars. That's exactly what he does. Why, this whole thing is... It's some kind of madness or something. That's exactly what it is. Some kind of madness. You best watch who you're seen with, Steve. Until we get this all straightened out, you ain't exactly above suspicion yourself. Or you, Charlie. Or any of us, it seems, from age eight on up. What I'd like to know is... What are we gonna do? Just stand around here all night? There's nothing else we can do. One of them will tip their hand. They got to. There's something you can do, Charlie. You can go home and keep your mouth shut. You can quit strutting around like a self-appointed judge and climb into bed and forget it. You sound real anxious to have that happen, Steve. I think we better keep our eye on you, too. I think everything might as well come out now. Your wife's done plenty of talking, Steve, about how odd you are. Go ahead. Tell us what she said. Steve walks toward them from across the street. Go ahead. What's my wife said? Let's get it all out. Let's pick out every idiosyncrasy of every single man, woman, and child on the street. And then we might as well set up some kind of citizen's court. How about a firing squad at dawn, Charlie, so we can get rid of all the suspects? Narrow them down. Make it easier for you. There's no need getting so upset, Steve. It's just that, well... Myra's talked about how there's been plenty of nights you spent hours down in your basement working on some kind of radio or something. Well, none of us have ever seen that radio. By this time, Steve has reached the group. He stands there defiantly. Go ahead, Steve. What kind of radio set are you working on? I've never seen it. Neither has anyone else. Who do you talk to on that radio set? And who talks to you? I'm surprised at you, Charlie. How come you're so dense all of a sudden? Who do I talk to? I talk to monsters from outer space. I talk to three-headed green men who fly over here in what look like meteors. Myra Brand steps down from the porch, bites her lip, calls out. Steve! Steve, please! It's just a ham radio set, that's all. I bought him a book on it myself. It's just a ham radio set. 
A lot of people have them. I can show it to you. It's right down in the basement. Show them nothing. If they want to look inside our house, let them go and get a search warrant. Look, buddy, you can't afford to. Charlie, don't start telling me who's dangerous and who isn't and who's safe and who's a menace. And you're with them, too, all of you. You're standing here all set to crucify, all set to find a scapegoat, all desperate to point some kind of a finger at a neighbor. Well, now, look, friends, the only thing that's going to happen is that we'll eat each other up alive. He stops abruptly as Charlie suddenly grabs his arm. That's not the only thing that can happen to us. Down the street, a figure has suddenly materialized in the gloom. In the silence, we hear the clickety-clack of slow, measured footsteps on concrete as the figure walks slowly toward them. One of the women lets out a stifled cry. <gasps> Sally grabs her boy, as do a couple of other mothers. It's the monster! It's the monster! I'm dun, dun, dun. We'll find out what happens tomorrow.